thank you. Um, before I start, I'd just like to make a verbal disclaimer. Um, I may live and work on a holiday island in Malta, uh, but if I, um, if I got this right all the time, I'd spend more time on the beach than working. But, so in reality, I don't get it right all the time, so please bear that in mind when you look at this. But anyhow, um, I, uh, I work for Heidelberg Cement, uh, more specifically for HC Trading and also HC Green Trading. Um, Heidelberg Cement is actually the world's largest heavy building materials company in the world, not Lafarge, but we are, <laughs> if you include aggregates, um, if you don't include aggregates, we are the third biggest producer of cement. Um, we are uh, 52,000 people, um, and I think the, from this we have 40% of our, our businesses in emerging markets. Uh, AC Green Trading is the international arm of Heidelberg. Um, we, the, the company started in uh, 96. Uh, Malta was established in 2005-2006. Coal side started in uh, 2008, and then Green Trading started at the back end of 2010. Um, the, 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 the activities of the business really are from West Coast USA down to East Coast um, uh, Australia from Arctic Norway down to uh, Equatorial Africa. The only continent really we're not involved directly is in South America, and, uh, but we do trading activities down there as well. And the role of AC Trading from, it, from a fuel perspective, um, we buy about a million tons for the group, predominantly in Europe. Um, of that, the shipment sizes last year were about 5,300 tons. They're pretty small, in, um, predominantly from the Russian markets. Um, but we also trade, last year we traded about 3 million tons of coal and petco. Um, we did about half a million tons of that in Europe, and about 2.5 million tons out of the Singapore office. Um, the Singapore office covers Asia and also South America. Um, and really, from a group perspective, it's Russian, US, and Colombian coal. And then really, uh, and also obviously Venezuela and, and US Petco. And then from a trading perspective, we need to add in South African, Indonesian, and Australian. So pretty much the world's supply. We do also buy out of Poland, and we also buy out of Spitsbergen in, in, in uh, uh, northern Norway, and um, anywhere else in between. Really. Um, in order to look at coal, you still, you can't look at it completely in isolation. You really do need to do some comparisons with other commodities. And I won't go into massive detail about this, but for me, um, we tend to really follow the Brent uh, prices. Um, um, for it, what's interesting about this slide is the fact that WTI has spread out from, from Brent at the beginning of last year. And my understanding of that is because Brent, uh, WTI is really influenced mainly by two or three refineries in the East Coast. And uh, it has really come away from really the international market. Um, so really we mainly follow uh, Brent. And obviously in the last few days Brent has fallen and this doesn't really reflect that. Um, on natural gas, um, the, this is a comparison really between uh, European prices, and uh, which is essentially UK here, and also the Henry Hub. And they really are two very different markets. The U U uh, European gas prices are relatively high today, but um, as uh, Patrick uh, described, uh, the gas prices in the States are really, really drawn down in a heavy, heavy way. And that fracking, ga fracking gas is, uh, a really, is here to stay. Uh, fracking gas is uh, some, something that uh, the US government will not allow to disappear. It's cheap energy, and I think really the future of the U.S. economy is based around cheap energy. In reality, um, it is a, a, a fantastic opportunity for the U.S. Um, it's only really when the um, the, the, the liquid uh, liquefied uh, uh, units that are set up for import are turned around will we start in Europe seeing some of this uh, gas come out. We are looking at it in in U.K. as well. Um, it's, it's fairly well known about the gas discoveries underneath Blackpool. Um, for me, um, the, the earthquakes that have been co that come out from, um, under Blackpool, um, they're for relatively minor. But if they are major, maybe we can get rid of Blackpool at the same time. That would be fantastic. <laughs> but the, um, 
But in, if you have to look at the, uh, the earthquakes in, its, in their own, they're, red, they're at the level of one, and a truck passing your house will make more than that. And we are experiencing UK earthquakes of this magnitude almost every day. So in reality, the uh, fracking in UK will carry on and will, will likely succeed. I know it's been banned in a lot of the rest of Europe, um, but uh, anyhow, it, is a, it, it, is a, it could be a fundamental change for our industry. Um, I've, this slide I find reasonably interesting. This is uh, based on October last year, where, um, and this shows the, the change of, of the various energy products since October last year. And you can see a, uh, a big difference between oil-based products and the rest of the energy market. It's only really the UK gas that stayed relatively stable. Um, WTI has had the biggest change. It's probably, it means that the gap between WTI and Brent is getting closer. But the main, for us, the main issue is, again, from here, gas and North, and North American power all being pulled down by the gas price, and therefore down to the EU coal price. There's a bit of a kick at the end here. Um, this, doesn't, this is really a reflection in the change of one month to the next month. Um, and also, this doesn't reflect the last uh, few days' price change. And this is a final slide. You can't really see the blue line, which is um, NYMEX, but you can see really the impact of the gas price on the coal price in the US and the other impacts at the end of the, end of the period. It's only really since, um, you can argue, from mid-2010 that we're really seeing the impact of the gas from the US. And prior to that, um, really we've been looking at, um, as Patrick was talking about, the exchange rates between dollar and euro. Um, we, also, we, um, we also look at the equity markets um, because they all have a direct Im impact. Um, histor historically, um, CFR prices into Europe um, um, have... It, when I first started coal, uh, coal was not very sexy. Today it is quite sexy. There's a lot of volatility in the market and we like to see some volatility. Um, and really, it's only since 1999, uh, really, when the paper market started, um, that we started to get more and more players in the market. And when those players, they were coming from the oil and gas industry or the equity industries, they brought in tools from those industries. So when there really is no real driver in the coal market, they use the energy uh, tools or the, the tools from the other industries to really try and make the market move or interpret the market. So. Prior to, prior to really um, 2010, the end of 2010, beginning of 2011, where we saw the gas price starting to affect, um, it's really other, other um, areas that really had, a, had an influence. And this goes specifically to um, my, it's a, my main focus from a, from a group perspective and for trading um, is, is predominantly the Russian market. Um, at the moment, the Russians are very concerned about uh, the low prices in, um, in, uh, in Europe. Um, it's, as I said, it's driven by the gas shell price um, knocking out US coal in, in the States, and we really feel this is here to stay. There was a flaw to the um, US coal price because Panama, the US main ship in Panama is not Cape Sur. So, in relative speaking, the the, the price will only go so far down from a US perspective. But the Colombians can go further. And the Colombians are shipping mainly in Capes and the Cape freight different. The, the issues yesterday with the freight market didn't really break out between the different freight sizes. And for us, it's quite key. There are, there are definite markets within the Baltic, within the Black Sea, in short seas, small, small size vessels. There are markets for Handymaxes, markets for Handys, markets for pa uh, Panamaxes, they all have a slightly different movement. And there is a definite difference between Panamax rates and, and Cape rates. So the, the market can fall further, but it'd be mainly driven by the Colombians more than anything else. Um, the, in answer to Patrick's question about the forward market going up, um, I personally don't believe that the market is showing that the market will fall, will rise over the next period. What it, the, our interpretation and why we're seeing high prices going forward is that the, the sellers are not prepared to sell at current spot rates. So they're posting high forward numbers on the basis that no one will really buy. If you actually look at the volume of traded coal going out one year, two years, three years, there's nothing, there's zero. 
and re in reality, those posted numbers are impacting on what the price the price setters are making. So re the real market is actually the spot market. Today. And if you look at um, the the market from a short to medium term, um, we with Russian. Um, there have often been problems with infrastructure. Since the collapse of CIS, um, there have been a lot of wagon problems, availability of wagons. Um, you have to remember that 50% that, uh, of uh, costs of Russian coal coming to the European market is rail logistics. Yeah, and in today's market, it's probably even 65%. Um, but the bigger players, the crew <laughs> trades, the uh, SUEX, um, and mere trades have all obtained their own wagons. And uh, at the moment, we don't really feel that um, the wagon infrastructure in Russia will cause any further issues. Perhaps with the smaller traders, the smaller producers, and they who don't have access, there may be some issues. Um, and on, so generally, from a, 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 a Rush, from a Russian perspective, we feel that the market will therefore will probably move more. Um, more sideways from the medium term to long term. Um, we, t we think that the US coal will continue to keep the price relatively low, but I think the Colombians really are going to set the, f the floor in the market. Um, and if we, if, we look at, if we look at the influence of fracked gas, I think the biggest influence will be if China takes up the mantle. Um, there's a lot of talk that they can do it. Uh, China has, in theory, on current reserves and current pricing, have 35 years' worth of coal. If that is true, and, and obviously I agree with Patrick that as prices go up, more availability happens, but there is a lot of pressure on the Chinese government to find an alternative there. So there will be, if they see the success of the US fracking, they will do it themselves. And if they can, and the talk is of trillions of cubic feet of gas potential. Um, and if that happens, that will have a monumental change on the coal price. Um, if, if China can, can cut back 20%, 30 40% of, of coal production by using gas, that will have a massive impact on our market. So it, it can, it, China is what certainly one to watch, but for longer term, not short term. Um, from our internal perspective, we try and look at what, try and identify some of the influences on the market. And for, um, as I said, the main influence I think for this year is the gas and it's a downward, downward pressure. Um, China, at the moment, uh, China uh, is growing at 7-8%, um, but their coal production is, generated, is growing at 15%. So there is more coal available in China this year than there was last year. So in re relative speaking, there is a, either negative or sideways pressure. Um, from, from China. I don't see a massive price increase coming from them. Um, I, think the work, I think we're all a bit numbed by the European market and, I, uh, and uh, economics and things, and I don't see at the moment that will have an immediate impact on our market. Um, maybe towards the back end if we do really see some... Uh, but I think most of it's already been factored in if it hasn't been factored in already. Freight down, I think, for the next two, two years, um, we will have a low, relatively low freight market. Indian demand. Um, India, as talked about earlier, is slightly different from China. They do produce a lot of coal, but they have um, very poor investment in the coal mines. Um, and uh, there is a structure. In China, they produce a lot of coal, and they can keep producing a lot of coal. And, and if they import or don't import, it's mainly based on price. In India, they have to import. And there's talk of by 2025 that India will import a billion tons of coal. It's a ma potentially a mammoth amount of coal that they could produce, import. So really, next year and continuing, I think India will have a, 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 have a positive impact on price. Um, Asia, generally, yes, it's have a positive impact. And then, obviously, we have weather influences. Well, the, the market at the moment is working really well. There is no I, individual area that is causing problems. Two years ago, yes, we did have flooding, but this year we have no flooding in Australia. We have no monsoon problems in Indonesia. We have no strikes in, in South Africa or, or Colombia. Everything is working really well. There's an oversupply really in the market. So if there is a weather issue, it probably will push the price up, but we're not, it's, everything's in balance and it's not going to be too influenced. 
and said industrial action, wagon shortages, and then other, who knows. But we, these are things we have to consider when we're looking at really at the pricing and everything else. Um, I will talk briefly on Petco because I bow to Patrick's knowledge more on Petco than I. We, we're, we're not big consumers of Petco. Our main focus has always been alternative fuels rather than Petco. But the market peaked massively in 2008. It collapsed thereafter. It peaked again um, in the end of 2010, beginning of 2011, and collapsed again. Um, the, the reason for this second collapse has been that there is a massive oversupply in the market. Um, there, there probably is, there's about 60-70% uptake of new demand, but there still is quite a lot of loose capacity in the market. Why did we get this final uptick? Um, I'm afraid all us uh, pet coat buyers are sheep. We um, jumped into the market all at the same time. We, did, we all have inventory issues at year end. We kept held back as much as possible, and we jumped all at the same time. And if everyone jumps, the market of pet coke is very inelastic. Um, it's a toilet end of an oil refinery. Um, there is a lot of, um, and it's a, there is no real flexibility in the system. The, uh, the, the uh, uh, fuel oil is being squeezed to produce the high uh, value products. Um, and in reality, they don't build a, a refinery to produce pet coke. It is a definite byproduct from the process. So there is. If, they, if the demand is high, pet coat prices go up. If the demand is low, pet coat prices go down in order to make sure the inventory goes. Um, and we are already seeing the pet coat price peak. Um, to, I think last night the pace prices came out and it was the same as last month. So in reality, um, we feel that the second half of this, this, um, this year the pet coat prices will come off because the market is still fundamentally low. And the, just a quick graph to show that the difference between the top of the market and the bottom of the market this last period is about $70. Um, as I said, low inventories. It was a mild winter this winter. Um, pet, cement industry is the biggest. It's, we have a big influence on the market. 35% of the pet coat production goes to the cement industry. So this winter being mild, there's more production activity. Um, so in reality, there was a little bit more demand required. Um, as I said, we were herd mentality of the buyers. Um, coal does put a cap on, 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 on pet coke prices. And reality, when pet coke and coal certainly are like for like in price, not necessarily a CB adjusted in price, people to do start switching. Um, we have, uh, uh, we have a, a number of different factories who can do 100% switching. Uh, Chinakali in Turkey, for instance, and does go 100%, 100%, and that we're currently on that cusp of switching back again. Um, and as I said, market, back up markets are essentially fundamentally long. Um, what tools do we as buyers have? And I, I'm just, just sorry to steal this, this mantra from the um, real estate industry, but in reality, we need to be flexible. Always flexible, flexible, flexible. And flexibility in terms of market timing, if you can get the market right, you can see that the, if you, the difference between the top of the market and the pocket market can be 70, 80, 100 dollars. So if you can get the market right, you can get your prices. That's your biggest tool. So you really have to understand the market well. Um, if you can fluctuate your shipment sizes, if the market's falling, take small shipments. It's, it's fairly, it's, rock, it's not rocket science, it's fairly easy and common sense. Play around with your stockpile management. Um, it's, it is a question of cash. No one wants to see big stockpiles, but if if Petco prices are on the floor, then build them up. Take, take, um, take big positions if you can. Um, encouraging suppliers, one of the key things, I think, often you, <coughs> you need a bit of a courage to take a new supplier on board. But it's, I think it, for us, we, we try and encourage new people into the market. It's, it's key to get more players. Um, and, and we're traders, um, but I, I still think traders have a good role to play in the business. Traders take positions, um, they can take positions at the bottom of the market, and they can give, give good value to you. So, yeah, I think, to me, uh, traders play a big role. Almost 60% of what we buy actually comes from traders rather than producers. Um, also, local coal. Uh, local coal does not always move with international markets. Um, it could be a landlocked product in Kazakhstan, the CVs are very low, um, and you can pay one 
dollar a gigajoule delivered to the factory because that coal can't move out. So in reality, um, it's really important. 75% of all our coal purchases are brought in, are produced in countries that we consume. Flexibility and quality. Quite often, the um, the, the technical manager is in a factory will dictate what coals you buy, and every every factory manager wants an easy job and everything else. Give them rubbish. It's really important. Give, you can give them rubbish. You can get you can get really low prices, and if you can widen the limits as much as possible, then it's for me it's really key. Uh, On-site blending. One of our factories in UK has 16 different coals all the time. We blend from different, to, to essentially making a cake. And we, we, can't, we don't have that flexibility on every factory, but where you can, it's, it's really important. And understand the limitations of the process. Is it, a, is it a handling issue that you have a problem with? Is it a mill size? Uh, do you not have gas suppression? Um, some factories don't have gas suppression, so you can't use high volatile material. Look at the, the coals available in the, the regional area. What, what if, you, if you do one process, can you expand the availability of the materials? Also, as I said, switching between coal and pet coke, increase alternative, alternative fuel use. Um, we, in a sense, we can burn most things. Um, I was looking on Wholesome's website the other day, and they say they burn diapers. Um, to be the, the guy responsible for the handling, the storage, the cleaning of the holes, why? God, uh, uh, but anyhow, we can burn anything. Um, so reality, Alternative fuels has low value, but it's, it still has heat. It's a, it, for us, it's a, it's a fantastic thing. Um, and then finally, as we all talked about here, get rid of the fuel altogether. Use fly ash, use slags, limestones, and everything else. Replace it. Um, that's an also an, a weapon that we can use. Last, last slide, really, these are the products that we, are, um, we, are, we as a company are, are, are buying. Cement and clinker, fly ash. Um, also, that we were uh, two years ago. We were the second largest importer of salt into UK. Um, we are. Uh, we have a, a range of products, so we have a good expertise on bulk commodities, and we do like trading. And we do like uh, the Heidelberg um, made some good money out of trading. And uh, unlike some of the other cement companies, we enjoy it. So that's the end of my presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed for giving us a very uh, candid and frank uh, and honest uh, look at uh, the operations. Uh, are there any question, questions or points from the floor? Stunned silence. <coughs> I think that was a very, very thorough uh, examination of, uh, of the situation there. Um, I think we're going to break for lunch. So before we do that, let's thank Joe once again for his excellent presentation.